Amen. So I was preparing this talk um, just over the last week and I was thinking, what is it that we want to speak here? Do I want to continue in a kind of like a series or something or do I just want to put my head down, start praying and say, God, give me a word. And this one thing just kept coming to me constantly. And so I'm going to preach on it today. And it was this phrase that was kept just going through me. And it, it went like this. It was, you're trying to wake God up, but God's actually trying to wake you up. And I was like, what? And it just kept coming over and over and over again. You're trying to wake God up, but God's trying to wake you up. And then, in, if you don't know, I've learned Portuguese. And so in my Portuguese lesson the following day, my Portuguese teacher, or Brazilian teacher, um, she said, Aaron, let's, let's take a passage from the Bible and let's talk on it. And I want you to try and preach it to me in Portuguese. So it's just one of the things that we, we do for my learning. Anyway, I took this passage and I said, what passage do you want me to use? And she said, I want you to use the passage where Jesus was asleep and the disciples are trying to wake him up. Um, because there's a great storm outside. And I went, yeah, no problem. And as I was trying to talk in Portuguese, let's be honest, I'm not the greatest at it, but I'm getting better. As I was trying to do this preach, if you like, in Portuguese, it just clicked on me. That phrase that had been going through my head all week, you're trying to wake God up, but he's actually trying to wake you up. And it just fitted with this passage. The disciples, they're on the boat. There's a storm around them. And they, they're getting fearful. They're getting scared. And they go down to Jesus and they say, Jesus, don't, don't you care that we're going to perish? Wake up, wake up. There's a great storm. And then Jesus gets up and he quietens the wind and he makes the waves stop. And all those things, you know the story. And then he goes, you of little faith, like how long do I have to keep doing this? How long do I have to keep doing this? And it just flipping and I thought, you know what? The disciples are trying to wake God up, but God is saying, no, I'm trying to wake you up. I'm trying to awaken you to the fact that I've given you everything that you need in this world. I'm trying to awaken you to the fact that there's faith within you. I'm trying to awaken you to these things. And so today we're going to look at you're trying to wake God up, but actually he's trying to wake you up. I've, I've had those moments in my life where it's like I'm knocking at the door, I'm knocking at the door, and I'm like, God, God, will you answer? Will you, will you answer me, Lord? And it feels like there's no answer, and it's like, are you asleep? I like, do you sleep? I thought your word says you don't sleep. And God's very much awake. God's very much awake. He knows what's going on, but actually in that quiet time, He's trying to awaken you to summer. He's trying to teach you summer. It's in the wilderness that we learn so much. If anyone's going through difficult times in here, if anyone's going through quiet times and it's like heaven's not answering them, know this, heaven's not deaf, okay? It's hearing you, but just because it's not answering you in the way that you want it or feel that you need it in that moment, it is not deaf. Maybe he's trying to awaken something within you. Maybe there's something far bigger going on because I might have said used this example before here. I may not have, but I know I've definitely used it before. But remember when you was at school and the desks are all lined up and you're doing a test now, you're in an exam and you've got that annoying person that just keeps walking down the aisle like this and it just keeps walking down and you, you get to a difficult question. It's like a maths question or something and you're like, I'm so stuck right now. I don't know what the answer is. And then the teacher walks past you again and you look at the teacher and you think to yourself, that teacher knows the answer. If you could just point, it's, num it's A. It's like, you know, you've got three, a multiple question kind of thing. There's three possible answers. Teacher, could you just, teacher just walks past silent. And it's like, but you could just help me in this moment. I'm stuck on this one question. And this one question is going to determine whether I get a C or a D, which is, Probably like a five or a four now or whatever they do now. Totally different. Anyway, it's like you could answer me, but the teacher just walks past and it just keeps doing it, keeps torturing you. Like you've got the answers and the answers keep walking past me. And I don't know the answer and I'm stuck right here. And it's just silent in the room. And in life, God can be like that. Like the father's in the room. 
He's in the room. And you're saying to the teacher, if you like, as they're walking past, can you tell me the answer? Teacher remains silent, walk past, said, shut up, don't talk, otherwise I'll rip your paper up. You know the score. And so the teacher walks past. In the same way, you're saying, God, answer me, answer me, God, answer me. And you're like, where is God? He's nowhere to be seen. He's nowhere around. He's nowhere near. And yet I want to say God's in the room. He's just trying to awaken you. The thing is, if the teacher was to say to you, okay, Aaron, I'll help you out. You're one of my favourite students. It's A. And walks past. You learn nothing. You just copied an answer. But when the teacher walks past you and you get that answer wrong or you figure it out, whatever may happen in that, you're learning something. In the same way, God's silence at times isn't to ignore us, isn't to just leave us and forsake us because the Bible tells me never will he leave me and never will he forsake me. So his silence in that moment is teaching me something. He's, he's doing something for me. He's awakening something in me that maybe was dead, maybe needed resurrecting again. He's awakening something. The teacher did a great job by keeping the class silent. The teacher did a great job by not pointing to the right answer for me. In the same way, the father does a great job when he doesn't answer everything that we want answering in the moment that we need it answering or feel we need it answering. When I was a new believer, I've got to be honest, I would pray the most simplest of prayers and it just felt like God just answered instantly. Like, I don't know what I'm doing here, Lord. What, how do you put this trampoline up? I can't do it. And then all of a sudden, it's like, ah, I got it. And it was like God would just keep raising my faith levels, raising my faith levels with the most simplest of things. And then as I got older in my faith, it doesn't always happen like that. It's like I have to go to my knees and press in and say, God. And it's not a case of the... God loved me more then, or I think God was just raising my faith, like, Aaron, I'm here for you. Aaron, I've got your back. Aaron, I'm real. There was a time when I'd, obviously, I'd come away from the drugs, and so now I've got no money coming in, I've got no finance coming in, I've got nothing, I've given my life to Jesus, and it's like, what do I do? The bills were piling up, and I said to Helen, like, what, what, what do we do? And she's, I don't know, I think Helen had just given her life to the Lord as well. And so I said, look, do you think God would be all right if I did one more drug deal and then we use that money to like clear the debt and then that would be it, just, just one more. Do you think he'd be all right with that? Remember, I'm like a few months into my faith. So I was thinking that would be okay to do one last time and then to clear the debt and here we go. I promise I'll start afresh then, Lord. Helen says, I don't think that's right. I don't think you should do that. So I goes, okay, um, I'll go upstairs. I'll read the Bible because the man at the church told me if you read the Bible, that look, God speaks to you through it. So I'm going to go upstairs, read my Bible. I was reading and I was on Matthew 6 and this part just like, it was like it was just shot up to me. Matthew 6 verse 33, I'll never forget it. It says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. Just before that, God was speaking about how he clothes the grass and how he feeds the birds of the sky. And I was like, okay, so it just hit me like really childlike. I've jumped up, ran down and says, no, we're not going to do another drug deal. That's not what we would do. God promises if I follow him, seek him, he'll provide for me. That's what we're going to do. We told no one. The same night, the same night, all these bills have been coming in. All these bills have been coming in. I'm thinking, what am I going to do? How am I going to sort this out? I don't have a job. I've, I've given my life to God. I'm trying to go the right way. I want to stay away from all the things that are wrong in this world. How do I sort this out? The same night that I, I saw that passage in the Bible, the same night we hadn't told anybody and all of a sudden there was kind of like, it felt like a knock at the door and so I, I got up, I went to go and answer the door but nobody was there but there was an envelope in my porch and it said, let no debt remain outstanding except the debt to love one another in Christ Jesus. It was a verse from Romans and inside it to the penny was the amount of money that we needed to pay these bills. Now, for me, I know it's, it's one of those uh, wow moments. It was for me anyway. But what it did to my faith in that moment is it just, my faith lifted up and I was like, uh, we seek first God's kingdom. We follow God and he will provide everything that we need. Not necessarily everything that we want, 
But he awakened something in me that day that I don't try and do it a different way now. A few, maybe 12 months later, I got a bit of correction later on because I'm no perfect man. I get things wrong, and I did in my early years. Maybe I got things a lot more wrong in my early years as a Christian than I do now. I better anyway, because if I don't look more like Jesus today than I did then, we've got an issue going on because I should be, if the right word's improving, not going backwards. Anyway, I got corrected at a later date because I started doing this work that I knew was, was not right. I started basically dodging the tax man. I've been a Christian for 12 months, 18 months. I'm dodging the tax man. I think I'm doing well because I'm doing a legal job. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. I'm providing for my family. But there was something in there that God needed to teach me. And so I got this huge bill come through from the tax office. And I was like, what? what's this? And it's like, oh, back to about 10 years ago, you had tax credits or something. And you're so many thousand pounds overpaid. And I was like, what? I don't even have tax credits. What's this about? And it turned out that there was a time when I'd accepted something that I shouldn't have accepted, didn't realise. Or I would have realised then. But anyway, it had gone past my mind. And now several years later, I'm now a Christian trying to do it right. And then I'm mowing the lawn. I'm mowing the lawn when I start trying to calculate all the money that I dodged the tax man with since being a Christian. And the two just came together and it was like, literally, to the penny, the amount I dodged the tax man with, this bill came in. And I just felt the Spirit of God speak to me in that moment, saying, Aaron, you follow me in all things. If you follow me, I'll back you up. If you go against me, there's corrections will happen. There's consequences. A good father will correct his children. That doesn't mean that we have fear like, you know, like a little child does a, a drawing, brings it home to their dad and their dad goes, oh, wow, that's amazing. That's a great picture. Gives them a cuddle, a kiss and all. That's amazing. But the next day, the dad's in a bad mood. He's, he's had a few too many to drink and stuff. The kid comes home, brings the picture. Dad, look at my picture. And the dad goes, that, that's ridiculous. That's a rubbish picture. God's not like that. God's not like if he's in a good mood, he's going to be good to you. If he's in a bad mood, he's going to give you a slap. He, he's not like that. He's consistent and he's true. He's the same today, yesterday and forever, the Bible says. And so you can trust God that he's got your best concerns at heart, if you like. The Bible says that he works for the good of all those that love him. So there are times when he will correct his children. I've needed correcting at times and I've took the lesson and I've learned from it. If you never learn from your mistakes, that's the issue. The issue is with you if you will not learn from your mistakes. You won't move forward. You'll keep going back around the same mountain until you get it right. God's not going to take you to B until you've completed A, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so when I can say, God for you, God will support you in all your needs, and don't just think finances. People get so et up with finances. Don't, don't worry about that side. I know it's important and it's needed. It's very needed, actually. And we'll have people in the room that maybe are struggling with financial things. Put your trust in God. I'm not going to be like some prosperity preacher and say, give God a tenner and he'll give you a hundred back. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, put your trust in God. Put him first. Put him first. Trust him. Okay? He'll provide for his children. At the same time, with the other things in your life, put God first. Put him centre. Matthew 6, verse 33 Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. Get that simple verse, take it with your life and say, I'm putting God first in all things. I'm putting him first in all things. And when you fall down, get back up. The Bible says the righteous man falls down seven times, but seven times he gets back up. Don't stay on the floor. Don't stay on the floor wallowing. Don't stay on the floor Get back up. Sometimes it's harder than it is the previous time or it's going to be the next time. But you've got to keep going. The kingdom of God is forcefully advancing. Remember in the early church, they were called the followers of the way. That means they're moving, they're following. Even if they're just crawling, just crawl in this life for a time. But keep going forward. Don't stand still. Don't go backwards. But keep going forward. 
Keep going forwards. Easier said than done. Totally. And it's really hard if you try and do it in your own strength. But when you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these other things will be added on to you. When you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, you put God first, I believe that he will put you first. And that doesn't mean he puts you first above the next person to you. It's just I can't explain it another way. You stand for God and God will stand for you. I've got no issues with that. And that doesn't mean that you get everything you want when you want it. The correction will come for a child of God. A good father will discipline his child, the Bible says. A good father. Have you ever known a father that, I mean, imagine your little child goes to put their hand in a fire. Can I slap their fingers? Don't. Burn. Burn. That, that one word. I think we all remember that one word as a child. Burn. Burn. So, yeah, it's going to burn. We all did it. As children, there was a gas fire in, not so much now, it's probably like radiators or something. But there's a gas fire in your living room and you go to touch it and your mum would say, no, burn. You, if you actually touched the fire, you didn't do it again. But your mum doesn't want you to touch the fire so you have to experience the pain. Your mum's going to try and correct you before you touch it. And, and God does that at times. But sometimes when we keep pushing and pushing and pushing, he lets us go. He lets us experience it for that moment. And what's happening in that moment? You're trying to wake God up, but he's trying to wake you up. He's been trying to shake you and wake you up for a long time. He's been trying to wake you up for a long time. He's trying to awaken you to things that you're neglecting, you're overlooking, you're not listening to. There'll be people in this room today, you've been calling on God's name, you're shaking God or you're in a prayerful way, in a, in a spiritual way. You're shaking and saying, God, 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 don't you care? Don't you listen? Aren't you interested? And I think God's been trying to get your attention all this time. And I actually think you're trying to wake him up, but he's actually trying to wake you up. There's a big difference. You know Jonah? Book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 1, verse 5 to 6. Did I give it you? Yeah. Then the mariners were afraid and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. You know the story of Jonah and the big fish? In the children's book it says the big whale but we won't get et up with that. But Jonah and the big fish, okay? So Jonah, God says to Jonah, Jonah will you go and do something? I want you to go over there to the Ninevites and I want you to tell them about the grace of God and the goodness of him that they might repent and turn. And Jonah thinks, I don't like those Ninevites. I don't like the Assyrians. I can't stand them. And the thing is, God will forgive them if they repent. So I'm not going. I'm going to go in a different direction. And so he jumps on a boat and tries to go somewhere else. And what happens is God sends a storm because... God's going to get his attention. And now this storm has happened and everyone on the boat is praying to their gods. The boat is full of pagans. The boat is full of people that have different idols, different gods. But Jonah's in there that knows the real God. And it says, but Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the, sh the ship, had lain down and was fast asleep. Jonah's fast asleep. It's verse six. Did I give you that as well? So the captain came to him and said to him, what do you mean sleeper? Like the captain goes, Jonah's asleep and he's, he shakes him. And he's like, oh sleeper, arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. Everyone's praying upstairs. Everyone's praying upstairs to their gods. But you know what I, I noticed? The one man, the one man that knew the true living God was asleep. The one man that knew the true living God was asleep while the rest of them upstairs were praying and crying out to their gods. In this world today, in many places, the people that know the one true God, they're asleep. And the world around them is searching and running after things that will not save them, will not hold them. And we need to wake up. In Gethsemane, when Jesus was praying just before he goes to the cross, he's praying and he says to his disciples, will you stay with me? Will you pray? And the disciple says, yeah, I'll pray with you. I'll pray with you. Jesus goes, prays, comes back. What were the disciples doing? They were fast asleep. It's a picture today, I think, of many churches 
Many Christians, you're asleep. You fast asleep. And you need shaking. You need to wake up to tell the world that Jesus lives. It is not a case of I received Christ, got a golden ticket to heaven, and now to, to hell with everybody else. I'm going my way. No, we've been called to tell the world that lives. We've been called to be a witness, an example. But we don't, we don't do those things. Why? Because this whole world, and I'm fed up and keep saying it all the time, but we're all about I, 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 I. I sort myself out and forget the rest. And yet the Bible tells us to love people more than ourselves. How do you do that? How do you put people above you? But we don't. We always put ourselves first. But the example that Christ gives us is to put others before us. We're to be a witness. And we're to show the world that Jesus lives. But what do we do? We do all sorts of things that are not honouring to God. And we do it for the whole world to see. We do it for the whole world to see and we just keep repeating those cycles. We just keep repeating them and repeating them and repeating them and repeating them. And then we think for some reason the grace of God just covers it all. Grace of God will cover it. We're an example. We're a witness to the world. And maybe the grace of God will cover everything that you do wrong. Maybe. It's not for me to decide that. I'm not God. I know that the mountain of grace is far bigger than the mountain of sin. But when we just continue in certain cycles and it doesn't break us, it doesn't take us to a place where we say, I want to get rid of this out of my life. Maybe God's shaking you today and saying, enough is enough. You can't just keep claiming me. You can't just keep, I want to have a little bit of God every six weeks. I'm going to just repent on Sundays, but do what I want Monday to Saturday. It, it can't continue in the church. And when I say in the church, I'm not meaning just this church or even this church. Hopefully this church isn't like that. But the church. But Hilda can't smoke and swear from Monday to Saturday and then turn up on Sunday and just be like, high five God. It doesn't make sense. The two don't go together. Hilda, stop smoking so much. <laughs> Hilda doesn't smoke, just so you know over here. Just want you all to know that. We've got to wake up, church. We, we have to shake. I always say, give your head a wobble. Like, give your head a wobble sometimes. Sometimes we need real talk. Sometimes we need a, come on, let's wake up. I don't think I can do a talk on, like, wake up. A lot really quietly. I've, I've got to get a bit of exile. Like, you won't wake up if I just whisper to you. Some of you are asleep in here. Like, wake up, Margaret. Like, literally, get, wake up. Show some respect. So... Joke again, Margaret's wide awake. I know you are, Margaret. I'm a bit loud today. I know you do. I know you do. But that's when James is talking, isn't it? You can't be. Don't tell me about those type of tablets. Anyway, let's jump to the other passage, Irene. Get me back on. Otherwise, I'll, I'll go off. Ephesians 5 verse 14, it says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. Just so you know in the context, it was talking about someone that's awoken up from darkness into the light. And then it goes on to say, now you must be a living example to the world. You must show the world. You've received this light. Now go show the world. Go tell the world. And most of the time we preach the gospel not by our words, but by our actions, by the things that we do. You're, you might be the only Bible that the outside world ever reads. Now you might say, oh, I hate it when he talks like this. I hate it when he like, starts pinpointing and saying, we've got to sort this in our lives. Got to sort it. But it's for your good and it's for their good. And it's, every sermon should have a challenge in it. If it doesn't have a challenge... And I always say this, as one finger points out, or it can feel like one finger's pointing, there's three pointing back at myself. I'm always, whatever I preach, whatever I talk on, I'm always checking myself. And nine times out of ten, I, I preach from a place where I've struggled from before, or where I'm having to deal with, or where I'm going through. So I'm not exempt in any way, shape or form. And there's not one person in this room that's got it all together. There's not one person in this room that 
it is perfect. If that was the case, Christ would never have had to come for us. So never take it as condemnation, but take the challenge and go with it. Don't, don't worry about a challenge. A challenge is going to sharpen us. A challenge is going to take us closer and direct us into the eye line of Christ. Anyway, John chapter two, 5, verse 2 to 3 here. It says, Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. When I was in Israel, I went to this place. I'd just throw that in just to show off. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralysed, waiting for the moving of the water. Verse 4. There's a whole group of people there in dire situation. They're in a dire situation and they're waiting for a miracle. They are waiting for God to do something. Verse 4 says, And for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Move on if you want to, Irene. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity of 38 years. This guy, 38 years. 38 years, been in a bit of a pickle. 38 years, been in a great pickle. And it's like, I've been here you know, with this problem for some time now. Any of us in the room like, had a problem for some time? I've got like 10 minutes, so if the worship team are aware in 10 minutes, in case you need a toilet break. <laughs> now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity. 38 years, any of us had problems for like a long time? It's like, it's just not moving, nothing's happening. Like, I've been here for a while now. It might not be 38 years, but... Two months might be a long time of something you're going through. Two weeks might be a long time of something you're going through. You know, if you were stuck in an oven for five minutes, that would be a long time, wouldn't it? Five minutes sitting next to a pretty girl, or an hour, no, five seconds sitting on a stove. Which one's longer? Five seconds sitting on a hot stove. A lot longer than sit five minutes sitting next to a pretty girl. You get the picture. Anyway, we all go through difficult times. Every single one of us, the time, the length... What might be long for you might not seem long for somebody else, but we're all, we're all different. That's why I would never say your mountain's not as big as that person's mountain, or that mountain's not as big as that person's mountain, or my mountain, or so on. We all deal with things differently. I can never say to someone that, um, you know, I lost my daughter, but I can never say to another man, I know what you feel like because I lost my daughter as well. Because I don't know what they feel like. We all deal with things different. I can say I've experienced that and I know what pain I felt. I know where it led me in my life. I know where it took me to, the pits. And then I can say, but then I've got this answer that you might not want to hear right now, but the way I got out of it, his name's Jesus. He pulled me out of the pit, out of the mud and the mire, and he placed a new song in my heart. He gave me a new song to sing, and he placed my feet on a firm rock. And that's why, church, I can't help but get excited about Jesus. That's why sometimes I like, seem like I'm in your face, because I know no other way. I know no other way. I was lost. I was dead. I was broken. I was blind. I was deaf. And then God made me alive. It was like I was a man for 38 years, sitting with an infirmity, not moving, not going anywhere, not doing anything. I'm in the bottom of the pit and I know no way out. And then all of a sudden, this light appeared, like Saul on the road to Damascus. And he's on his way to kill the Christians. And then all of a sudden, a light appears. What happens? Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then this great miracle happens and Paul is used. Saul, that his name, Paul, is now used to go and preach to the Gentiles, to me and to you. I had like a road to Damascus experience in my own life. Not literally a bright light. I'm just saying I was going completely in the wrong direction. And then I had an encounter with God. And that's why I'm so passionate about him. The Bible says whoever's been forgiven much loves much. That's why I just always am what I am. That's why I call myself Marmite. Some of you will love me, some of you will hate me, but I can't do it another way. I only know one way, and that's to plead to people as if they were about to die. To plead to people as if they were about to drown. It's like I've got a lifeboat, and I can pull you onto this lifeboat. The real life, this is church's life and death. The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. 
It really is. Uh, I'm not even going to use the word I believe it because believe it means there's an opportunity that it might not be true. All I can say is I know it to be true. I know it to be true. This man that was 38 years sitting in his dire circumstances, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he'd already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Now, what kind of question is that? The guy's been sitting there for a long time. He's paralysed. He's, he can't get up. He's, he believes whether it actually happened or it didn't happen, whether it's a myth or it's a genuine thing that happened. I personally don't know. wasn't there. But he believes that if he can get into this water when it's stirred by the angel, he's going to be healed. He believes that this man does. 38 years he's been trying. And Jesus says, do you, do you really want to be healed? Verse 7. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. We always come up with excuses in this, in this world. We always come up with an excuse. But it's like, if, if you really want it, you're going to go the extra mile. You're going to do it. It's... I use, and it's easy to use addiction as something, because I've mentioned it a few times today, but with myself, and I like to point the finger at myself and never point at other people, so it's easy to use myself. But addiction, let's be honest. How do, and take God out of addiction at the moment, because many men that aren't Christians have beaten addiction, so I can't even say, I can prove to you God is real because he took away my drug addiction. I can't say that because many people have gone to AA and other things and they haven't got God. So I can't say that's my proof. The other things I can show you as proof. But addiction, unless there's something in me that says, I really want to beat this. I really want to do this. I'm never going to beat it. I'm never going to beat it. Now, God can help me with that and God can help me with the steps to go in there, but I'm never, ever going to beat it unless it comes to me that I, I must defeat this. But I can make excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse, and so I did. So I did. Every, every day there was another excuse. On the night when I was doing the drugs, it'd be like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm stopping now. I'm stopping. The next day, I ain't stopping. I, I couldn't stop. It had grabbed hold of me. I didn't really want it. It came to a place where I was desperate. I was broken. I was like, I'm, I'm at the bottom of the pit and if I don't change, I don't want to think what's going to happen. I had to come to that place. Maybe this man, 38 years, sitting there, he's coming up with a whole lot of excuses. A whole lot of excuses. And it's like, you could shuffle. Like, you can't get up and walk. But well, you could shuffle on your bum. Might be uncomfortable for a bit, but you could shuffle. You could slowly make your way there. There's ways. Don't get me wrong. He could have talked to somebody else. Like, will you just get me down here? I'll pay you this if you can just get me to this. You know, there's ways. We make excuses all the time, but sometimes we need to come to a place. And sometimes that's the place when we get to God saying, I've been trying to wake you up for a long time. You're trying to wake me up. You want me to just step in and do everything for you? But actually, I'm trying to teach you things on this journey. I'm trying to wake you up. And the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water's stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Verse 8. Jesus said to him, Rise up, take your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well. He took up his bed and walked. And on that day, it was the Sabbath. Jesus gave a command, the young man, or the middle-aged man, he, he followed. He followed that command, there was obedience that took place. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. That was a command that's given in the Bible in Matthew chapter 6, 33. It's advice, it's wisdom, command, whatever wording you want to use. Whatever wording will get you through the day, whatever wording will get you to look at it and start doing it. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Follow Jesus. There was a command given by Jesus. Look, get up, rise up, take him out and walk. Now what happened here? This man had this excuse. Whether it's a truth or it's just an excuse, it, it doesn't matter. Because the truth is, sometimes there's real circumstances that stop us being able to move forward. 
And maybe it was a real circumstance what stopped him being able to move forward. But here's where the picture of grace comes in. Because this man said he couldn't get to the water. He couldn't get to the water. So what happened? The water went to him. Jesus is the water of life. You know, Jesus, if you like, he was trying to get into the well, but he couldn't get to the well, so the well went to him, if that kind of makes sense to you. Jesus went to him and said, look, you can't get there, so I'm coming to you. That's the picture of grace. That's the grace what so many times Christians abuse, by the way. We, we abuse grace too much. We do what we want, and then we think the grace of God will just cover it. Well, that, that's an abuse of grace. And so we can't do that. But that's grace. Grace is you can't get there, so I'm coming to you. I think in my situation, when I talk about addiction, I think it was the grace of God. I think it was the grace of God that I couldn't get to the water, so the water came to me. But you know, if I was addicted now, he's, he's given me that grace once before. I think he'd teach me a new way now. I don't think it would just be like, Aaron, done with we dealt with that. He's, I think I'd have some moments where it would be different. I don't think the second time round I would maybe have it that way. Maybe I would, maybe I, I wouldn't. I don't know. I'm not going to mess around to try and find that either. All I know, immediately the man was made well. He took up his bed and he walked. And on that day, it was the Sabbath. He took up his bed, he walked, he was made whole. He asked earlier, do you want to be made whole? You know, not, not do you just want to be made well temporary? It's do you want to be made whole? Whole means complete, or it, it did with that word anyway. It meant do you want to be complete? Do you want to be completely, complete made whole? There's a difference between a temporary fix and a complete wholeness, a complete, I'm set free, I'm moving forward. And that's the place where Christ wants to get to us, each and every one of us. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. You're waiting for God to wake you up? No. You're, you're trying to wait. You're trying to wake God up. But maybe he's trying to wake you up. This man was waiting for God to come and heal him. But God was waiting for him to rise up, take up his bed and walk. Maybe God is waiting for you to do something now. Maybe it's, hear this right, maybe it's not on him, but it's on you. Maybe it's your time to do something. It's like, stand up. Stop with the excuses. Stop with the, I'm at the back of the line, I'm always forgotten about, nobody, this, that and the other. Like, just stop it. We've got a good father that loves us, cares for us. He wants to correct his children. He does, because that's what a good father does. I've got two children that I correct, although they're a bit older now and they tell me to shut up because they're like 22 and 18, so maybe they're not good examples. But anyway, when they were younger... I was the boss. No, not so much. But a good father will correct his children. If you get corrected by God, it's because he loves you. It's not because he's against you or he doesn't like you or he's sick and tired of you making the same mistake. No, 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 no. That, that grace, that mountain of grace, and that's when you've got to remember the mountain of grace is bigger than the mountain of sin. But don't abuse the mountain of grace. Don't abuse it. Like, I can do what I want, repent tomorrow. That's not a heart that truly knows God. A heart that truly knows God wouldn't be saying those kind of things, wouldn't be doing those kind of things. In the same way, you've, this man, he's waiting for God to come and touch him. And God's waiting for him to stand up. God said, no, get up, stand up. On the boat with Jonah, there, yeah, let's forget Jonah a sec. On the boat, when Jesus was asleep on the stern, the disciples went to Jesus, waiting for Jesus to get up. And Jesus' reaction after he gets up is one of those, oh, couldn't you have dealt with this yourself? It's like, you're trying to wake God up, but maybe God's trying to wake some of you up today. 
Father, we just pray, we thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Jesus, as always. I never get tired of saying you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life, and there's no other way.